All right, so we have a, a very full panel, um, and uh, we're trying to make up time lost uh, from earlier. And so what I'm going to do is take the approach of the 9 o'clock panel and have every participant make just a few remarks about the work that they do and their thoughts on the role of data and technology and innovation in achieving the SDGs. Um, I'll ask just one or two questions and then leave most of the questions to the audience. Um, so we will start um, on my immediate right, Yusuf uh, Murangwa, who is from Rwanda. He's a director general of statistics um, in Rwanda. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, as you said, I'm Murangwa Yusuf, uh, the Director General of the Statistics Office in Rwanda. And uh, uh, data, technology, and innovation, uh, I would say briefly, it's indispensable for the SDGs. Uh, without data, without uh, uh, technology and innovation, we'll not make it. We'll not make it come 15 years from now. Uh, even if we made it, we'll not know that we've made it. Uh, so it, it's very important that, uh, that we harness data and the technologies and innovations that are coming up. Uh, in Rwanda, we are looking at it uh, in three ways. One uh, is to, to do what we've been doing as a statistics community at large, uh, but doing it uh, cheaper, doing it quicker, and doing it more accurately. So that's very important because we don't have a lot of time, we don't have a lot of money, yet we have to do a lot of things. And uh, this time round, we have to be more accurate uh, in what we are doing. Uh, the second thing is uh, to increase scope and do some of the things that we failed to do, uh, especially in the MDGs, uh, using current uh, technologies and innovations. A good example would be uh, there was a lot of discussion uh, about agriculture and especially land use. In Africa, uh, one of the biggest challenges that we have, we don't understand uh, the land that we have. We don't understand the land. We don't understand what we are working on on the land. And uh, with today's technology, for example, satellite imagery, uh, you can easily do a lot of work and quickly and cheaply. And these are things that are already being done. For example, in Rwanda, we're already doing that in assessing agriculture and everything. And you can do like three, four rounds of that kind of assessment in a year, which is record time and more accurate and cheaper. And the third dimension is, uh, I would call it harvesting, harvesting the data that now we have. Uh, there's a lot of data out there. Uh, there's a saying about social media, uh, but it's wider than that. We are seeing a lot of mobile money transactions. Uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, uh, communication signals, uh, telecommunication signals uh, that, uh, that are with us all the day, every day, uh, and social media as well. Uh, we have technology now that can harness uh, and, and cultivate uh, that information uh, to give us quick uh, statistics and information and data about what we are doing and who is where, and doing what, and what are the issues. So it's very important those three dimensions uh, that are factored in uh, in the SDGs so that we can know uh, uh, and work on the SDGs. Now, finally, data alone is not enough. You have to go higher the value chain. From the data, we need good and robust statistics. And from that level, we need to have good information products that guide us to policies, that's what our politicians want. That's what the general public wants. They don't want to be crazy about a lot of data and a lot of statistics. They want to know the information products that lead to policies and therefore decisions, to take decisions that will make lives better for everyone. Thank you very much. All right, Claire. Thank you very much, um, and, and thank you, Yusuf. My name is Claire Malamed, and I'm the Executive Director of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. 
which is the data partnership for the SDGs. Um, we're very pleased and proud to have His Excellency the Vice President of one of our board members. And if any of you are in any doubt about the role of data to power progress on the Sustainable Development Goals, then I urge you to look at the speech that His Excellency the Vice President gave at the Ghana Forum on the SDGs in April. It's still, to my mind, the best and the most persuasive speech by any politician on the power of data. We've talked a lot um, already in the last few days about all the things that we need to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. We've talked about money, we've talked about political commitment, we've talked about institutions. The thing that we haven't talked about yet and that I'm really pleased to be talking about on this panel is knowledge and data. It's a cliche to say that knowledge is power, but it really is. And of course, data is the raw material for that knowledge. And there are so many ways in which data is absolutely critical to, to achieve the SDGs and to power the kind of progress and the kind of ambition that we've been talking about over the last few days. We heard earlier from, um, from my friend Omar Seydou, on, also on the panel, about the power of data to unlock financing and the power of data on businesses and homes to unlock improved tax collection and financing for all of the things that we need. We've heard a lot in the previous panel about the absolutely critical importance of getting agriculture right to achieve the SDGs in Africa. I hope that some of you here have, um, in the audience have heard of the Ghanaian company Farmaline, who are taking some of the weather data that, um, that my colleague just talked about and turning it into apps to give weather twice a day weather data to farmers in their local languages. And it's this kind of data turned into knowledge and the kind of information that people need at the time when they need it and the way that they need it, which is critical for powering the SDGs. It's these sort of partnerships that the global partnership exists to to develop. We're working with a number of space agencies, with NASA, European space agencies and others, to create a regional data cube for Africa where we can bring in the satellite data and make it available to governments across the region, to, to, to governments, to people who want to develop apps, to individuals, to universities across the region, to turn it into all of these kind of products that can help to power the improved productivity, employment, income generation that we've been talking about, which is so critical. So I think if we start to see data along with money, along with human resources, as one of the absolutely key ingredients in, how, in achieving the SDGs, what does that mean for, as one of the other themes of the last few days, doing things differently? Of course, we need to think about the physical infrastructure. We already talked about the critical importance of connectivity. A lot of the exciting, most exciting and dynamic areas of data are being driven by new technologies, mobile phones, data that comes from mobile phones and others. But of course, that's only possible if you've got the basics right with coverage and connectivity that mean that actually all people can be heard in that data and all people can be reflected in that data. There's no point in talking about leave no one behind if we're leaving people behind in the data that we use. So again, it's about investment in the physical connectivity. It's about getting the institutions right, the political priorities, making the kind of institutions that will encourage data to be shared, data to be open, data to be used. Sometimes people say that data is the new oil, but I actually think that this is a misinterpretation. Oil can only be used once, but data becomes more valuable the more times it's used. So it's very far, I think, from being oil. So I hope that on the, as the rest of the panel and in the questions, we're going to be able to talk a little bit more about some of the very practical ways that we need to make this happen. But let me just leave you with this idea that data is a critical part of the infrastructure for achieving all of the things that we've been talking about. Thank you. All right. We'll move on to the next panelist. Thank you very much, our facilitator. Good morning to everybody. Um, building on what has already been, been said, I believe that um, comprehending um, the issue of data and the SDGs can be better attained by going back to basics. Um, I think the point has been made and repeated by um, uh, the former speaker that uh, when we talk about SDGs, um, 
We are probably not talking about um, uh, anything different in a fundamental way that we uh, might perceive. We are probably talking about the same things, a development process, transformation, but doing it uh, in, in more comprehensive ways with depth and sense of um, urgency. Um, well, I should have started by introducing myself. I took it for granted <laughs> since I was one of the presenters. I'm Lamin Mane. I'm the director of UNDP's uh, Regional Service Center, and we provide a policy program and uh, operation support to all the 46 African countries. And uh, one of the areas uh, with which we are profoundly uh, involved is uh, the issue of um, SDG monitoring. So we are very much uh, uh, in the trenches as far as the data issue is, uh, is concerned. Um, so as I said, um, we're talking about the um, same things that we've been doing, but doing them differently. Now, monitoring uh, has become very important. It was done before. Um, but now when we take into account the fact that we have um, 17 goals, um, 169 in the, uh, uh, targets and close to 300 indicators. We had challenges to monitor progress within the context of MDGs, um, which were eight goals, uh, and uh, 16, I believe 16 um, indicators and 16 targets and 48 indicators. So when you compared it, we had challenges. So now, when you compare that with the the situation with respect to the SDGs, we have a bigger, bigger challenge. But let's go back to the basics. Um, what are we trying to measure? What are we trying to, um, to evaluate? First, if you talk about uh, the growth issues, we'll be, talking, we'll be looking at the data relating to GDP. If we talk about health, uh, we will be looking at data related to DHS. Uh, that uh, our health uh, UNFPA colleagues are very um, familiar with. If we are talking about um, food security, zero hunger, we'll be, we'll be looking at agricultural production you know, data. So that is my starting point. We have to go back to the basics. So what are the challenges? Um, first of all, you know the challenges about um, statistics in Africa. Um, under-resourced, underfunded. Uh, these are one of the statistics is very important. If you cannot measure, you cannot manage. But we all know that chronically statistics departments have been seriously under, underfunded. So that is the starting point. How do we improve on that? Ensuring that uh, our statistical machinery is well-resourced, well-staffed, and the institutional frameworks strengthen. Um, the second issue that we have to quickly deal with, uh, this has been touched upon by the two previous speakers, then in addition to that, addressing those resource issues in a more mundane manner, we have the opportunities of the revolution, the data revolution, the progress in technology uh, that we can harness. Um, Yusuf made a reference to the use of um, satellite imaging in Rwanda. Quickly, that can be done very, very quickly. It's a matter of seconds. You have images about population concent concentrations uh, in the country. Look at the use of mobile phones for registration. Um, if, if you follow the normal procedures for registration within the context of elections, you have to visit households, people will have to come. But with mobile technology, um, you can do registration in minutes. Uh, the people will send the data, take a picture of themselves. This is a matter of seconds. So there is the speed, and there is the, the potential also to lower uh, the cost of, uh, of, 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 of the processes. Now, not to take um, you know, too long, uh, I would like to end um, you know, by saying, uh, that uh, in tapping into the potentials of data technology, it's not an automatic process. We have to train. You have to, you have to create the infrastructure you know, for it. 
uh, and this will require investment. It will also require um, you know, partnerships. So let me end by saying that we have the challenges of monitoring, but we have huge opportunities um, that can be tapped to help us um, respond to, to those um, challenges. But it will require the strategies to build infrastructure uh, for it, and that will also require you know, partnerships. Thank you. So, um, Omar, just, just to guide your comment a little bit, um, you, you work with demographic statistics, and if you could, as you're describing your, your work, tell us a little bit about how you're sort of taking the data and producing information that guides policy around demographics. I mean, there's this demographic boom happening in Africa. Um, we don't know if it's going to be long-term positive or negative, depending on how we handle it. Are you uh, working with other government agencies around how to manage population growth, for example, and are you doing it just within the country you're operating, Ghana in this case, or is this something that you're talking about across the continent? Thank you very much. Um, I'm Omar Seidu from the Ghana Statistical Service. Yeah, if uh, you look at the SDGs, achieving them largely depends on data. Because if we say that no one should be left behind, then we can only know who is behind by using data. And we can better target interventions by using data. For that reason, we have assessed the capacity of the national statistical system, not just the Ghana Statistical Service, but the entire national statistical system, to see how are we positioning ourselves to meet this challenge. So we came up with a couple of priority areas that have to be dealt with. And this came through from the roadmap forum we held in April. And one of the key things we identified is filling the data gaps. Secondly, encouraging data use, because it doesn't make sense to produce a lot of data if it is not utilized. And the third thing is strengthening the entire data ecosystem. Now, some of the key initiatives that we have started since April to meet this challenge is one, administrative data is one of the key drivers in monitoring progress to achieve the SDGs, because that is the only way you are able to identify pockets of people or areas where interventions need to be focused. Sample surveys, by their design, technically, leave some people out who are usually called the statistically invisible people. But administrative data has the power to give you information about these people. So what we did is we identified that Denmark is one of the few countries where 95% of the data they use for planning is from administrative data sources. So we said, okay, in the case of Ghana, from our assessment, 57% of the data we need for the SDG monitoring is from administrative data sources. So what do we do? So we started discussions with Statistics Denmark on how we can partner them to build and strengthen the administrative data system. As we speak today, we have already signed an MOU on that. Secondly, we realize there's a lot of data sitting there that is not mined beyond the normal tabulations. So we initiated discussions with the Office of National Statistics in the UK. And that also, we just completed a scoping mission recently. And we're going to have a system where we're going to build data science capacity in the country, not just in GSS, so that we have a pool of expertise in the country who can mine data. And data interoperability is one of the key things here. Because if you can combine data from censuses and surveys, with data from administrative sources, then you can get more layers of information that can drive development, not just monitoring. And here I'm happy to mention that we identify the private, private sector data is one of the key things that we need for SDG monitoring. 
And so we started discussions, and thank God, we have gotten one private sector entity in the country that is willing to provide the data they have, combine it with survey data for SDG monitoring, and that is Vodafone Ghana. So we go, we're partnering with Vodafone Ghana to use the data they hold, combine it with survey data, and look at some applications in internal migration, um, communicable diseases, and others. So in dealing with population and the demographics, you realize that private sector data, administrative data, are these two key areas that we need to strengthen beyond the censuses and survey. So these are some areas that we are focusing our attention. Thank you. Okay, and so, and so finally, uh, Professor Yao Nyako, um, Professor of Economics at NYU, but I know you're working quite a bit in Ghana and working in a rural village uh, in, with your research, if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Yao Nyako, as I just said. I'm a professor of economics at New York University. Uh, as an economist, I think data is extremely important. Uh, but I've sort of moved from the ivory tower, and I actually have moved to my village, a small village called Kumu. It's in the Ashanti region. And I believe that technology is very, very important, and it's what I am doing right now. Uh, when we talk about the sustainable development goals, I think we should all focus on the word sustainable. Uh, sustainable means that you will continue it, and unless you've got the technology right and you know how to do things, it just simply won't happen. Um, I feel like saying to some of you, uh, at least definitely we the Ashantis, uh, we lost our war with the British because of technology. They had better guns than us, okay? In the uh, late 1800s, uh, there was a big economic revolution in this part of the world, and it's called the Cocoa Revolution, and we should all be proud of this. This is something where Tete Kwashi went to neighboring Equatorial Guinea, smuggled some cocoa seeds, brought them into um, the Ashanti region, Eastern region, Aquapim area. They figured out the technology, how to grow all of this, and created an industry which still provides for this country a huge part of its export earnings. So technology is key. What have I done? I've left, um, I haven't left, I'm still a professor at New York University, but I'm in the village now. I have a research center in the village and I have computer scientists there. We are creating uh, mobile phone apps to help the farmers trade. Uh, the opposite of sustainable is vulnerable. Many of our farmers are vulnerable because they're at their farms, they're waiting for traders to come to uh, pick up their goods, and sometimes nobody shows up, and therefore they are poor. We've got these mobile phone apps, we've got people who are buying these things on our system, and so farmers all over will be able to get into that system, okay? And so this is technology. Uh, we've been asked by the Ghana government because of our work in this technology to help in the establishment of a Ghana Commodities Exchange, which I think is going to revolutionize uh, life for our farmers. Again, what is a commodities exchange? It's a way of trading commodities, right? There are only two things in a commodities exchange. Number one is you need warehouses, and number two, you need technology, how to communicate people. Again, technology is going to be extremely important. In the village where I am, I've been, I'm now the chairman of something called the Customary Land Secretariat. Anybody who wants to buy land in our area, and we have 3% of Ghana's land mass. Okay, this is the Afram Plains area, so it's a big area. Uh, so we've created an office where anybody who wants to buy land, uh, determine the size of their land, they come in. How are we, a relatively small research institute, able to do that? Again, mobile phone apps. You give the app to a farmer, you tell the farmer to walk around the perimeter of their land, and boom, all of a sudden, you've got the boundaries. You can put it in a computer, you can digitize it, okay? So our customary land secretariat is based on um, technology, and we're hoping to uh, tell the rest of the country about that shortly. In our center, we have students from Ashesi University and uh, it's unfortunate, uh, Patrick, you should have been one of the uh, people speaking here. He's created a university which is world class and is pumping out students who are great software engineers. Um, I've hired many of them. 
And again, I ship them all into the village. Uh, for many of them, it's a big shock, okay? Uh, going from Accra into the village. And somebody was mentioning, how do you make agriculture cool again? Well, combine it with technology and apps and coding and everything. And last I heard, our students are really enjoying all of that. In any event, so I think uh, technology is key, technology is crucial, and um, that's what I do, and that's how I support the SDGs. Thank you. All right. So um, I just checked my time, and we have only 15 minutes more. So. <laughs> because we're trying to make up from the previous session. So I'm going to ask just two questions and then have you answer them and then we'll come to the audience right away. And my questions are going to be connected. Um, Yusuf talked about information products. And there is a set of, there's a body of information about, how shall I say, economies that have grown rapidly in the last, say, five decades. Um, mostly in Asia. And so my, question, my first question is, are we leveraging that information to, to help us chart a path in Africa? Um, and if so, how are we doing so? Uh, because they, they've started achieving the SDGs five de decades ago, I would say. And my second question is related, which is that the world has seen rapid advancement, um, actually all over the world, has involved industrialization, and a specific kind of industrialization, uh, labor-led manufacturing. Now, today, technology is changing. There's more automation. There's more machine intelligence. And there's a big question about whether Africa will be able to repeat what happened in Asia. It almost feels like we are now in a story or in a movie that we haven't seen before, right? What are your thoughts on that kind of technology and innovation and what that means for our ability to achieve the SDGs? And I'm gonna, just these two questions, open to all of you to answer and then we'll, we'll turn over to the audience. Yeah, uh, in the interest of time, I'll just pick one. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Uh, are we leveraging the information that we have? I would say yes and no. <laughs> and, and it's a big no, and a very small yes. Uh, the reason I would say yes, I'll give an example to Rwanda. Today, uh, back home, we've just launched a report about the demographic dividend uh, of Rwanda. There is a lot of information. Yesterday, my minister talked about the vision 2050 that we want to get in Rwanda. And there is a lot of debate in Rwanda how we could be a high-income country by 2050. And uh, you'd think there is no information to guide us to go there. Yet there is a lot of information. So we took that task at the statistics office we worked with partners, we worked with the UNFPA, we worked with very many experts, academics, and everything. We did analysis. We did three scenarios. One scenario, of course, we want to be high-income countries by 2050. And it's a good ambition. It's worth it. And break it that down uh, to SDGs 15 years from now and again. And we realized we need to have growth of around 12% per year from now to then. And that brought a very interesting debate. Some would say, no, it's not possible. But the optimists said, it is possible. Some other countries have done it. We just have to think out of the box. And the debate is not yet over. The debate has just started. But that's a very good example of how information can be used. And then people start planning backward. Start planning backward and actually make decisions and implement going forward. Very possible, and it's already working. Now, we're only using very little information that we have. Uh, my colleague from the Statistics Service in, in Ghana just said that. 
we think we can do that in education, we can do that in agriculture, we can do that in population management, we can do that in infrastructure, we can do that in every other thing. We are not yet there. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Let me have a, a go at both and take a slightly different um, tack. I think your question about rapid growth and the lessons from the, whether one country or one region is adequately learning the lessons from another. It's an interesting question. I also slightly think that it demonstrates the limits of data. And let me just explain why that is. I think there are many different interpretations of what those lessons are, what the lessons from the East Asian experience are for individual African countries today. And there are many different arguments about what was the secret or combination of secrets that, um, that led to that rapid growth in East Asia, whether it was a particular um, global economic circumstance, the role of education, the role of specific state policies around trade policy, um, support to industry, and so on. Those things are all quite fiercely fought over. I think we probably don't... They're, they're, it's probably arguable that there could be better information and better data to illuminate those arguments, those conversations, and to give us a better sense of which, what are the most probable causes. But I don't think that we should look to data to take the politics out of politics. Data can illuminate arguments, and data can make political debates about policy, about some of these critical choices on a firmer footing and underline what the consequences of different choices might be. But data can't necessarily give you the right answer. Some of the answers are still political. Data can't tell you what the correct tax policy is because your tax, the, the definition of a correct tax policy depends on whether your version of correct includes a, a particular amount of redistribution or a particular set of incentives that you're trying to create for different activities. Data can help to show the consequences of those choices, the implications of those choices, and lay out what the choice is. But data can't be a substitute for the politics of those choices. And I think to some extent that is true of choosing an industrial policy and learning the lessons of other countries. On the question of automation and change, I, against um, some, although not all of the evidence, I'm resolutely an optimist about technology. And I do feel, you know, certainly coming uh, from the UK where we've had, you know, in the sort of previous eras of industrialization, 17th, 18th, 19th century, we've had bitter fights about technology and the fears of technology displacing labor in all kinds of industries. They've all been both true and false in that technology did displace labor, but technology also created the opportunities for people to move to more productive, more satisfying, safer, better jobs. So I am, um, one of my degrees is in history, and I uh, always often return to, to history to give us answers to some of these questions. It's, it's unusual that we see something in the world which is entirely new and has never happened before, and I am hoping, although without any certainty, I don't think any of us can be certain, as you say, in this very new landscape that this current era of automation and of changes to technology will echo other periods in history where absolutely we saw change, and change which to individuals is terrifying and frightening, and where the role of governments has to be to, to make those changes easier through social protection, through education, through other policies for individuals. But at the level of society, those changes have generally been positive. And I hope that we are seeing, will be seeing we will be sitting here in 20, 30 years' time that we will be answering that your question in the positive. I may have missed your, the gist of, of your question about the comparative analysis of the, of the growth uh, nation in Africa and probably the, um, the role of technology and data. Um, I think our starting point should be to remind ourselves that um, Africa's growth performance during this episode that we talked about from 2000 to 2015 has been very impressive. Uh, it's not very far, it's been the second fastest growing region in the world 
not very far from the first that was Asia. Now, what is the difference? Uh, the difference has been in the growth episode in Asia, they've been more successful in diversifying the economies. So the sources of growth have been more diversified than in our region. Uh, we had been probably growing on one and a half legs, the raw material production, the raw material sector, uh, the, the oil, you know, and, and agricultural raw materials. So we saw the effect of the vulnerability uh, that goes, you know, with that. I think we have to we have to remember that. That's a major lesson for the next episode. There has to be true transformation. Now, transformation actually those also go with technological development. No doubt about it. You all know the advantages of the manufacturing sector. One of the advantages of manufacturing sector is the fact that it embodies more technological um, change than, let's say, in agriculture, except in instances that uh, Professor Yao has just, just said. So I, I really want to put that you know, on the table, that yes, it is true that they are now they are using more technology, but we were not very far. And also, if you remember the presentation on the actual situation of the regions with respect to SDGs, it doesn't also mean that Asia is doing much better than us now they are, if you look at the red shed, it's not very, very far from, from ours. Because the more progress you make, those, um, the, 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 the sheds you saw, the red, um, the more you do, the, the less red uh, the, the sheds will become. We are not very, very far from Asia. Latin America, interestingly, is doing, um, is doing better. Uh, but facilitator, what I want to end up you know, with, uh, is applying these lessons we do across the continent. We do have very encouraging episodes, like what Professor has just said, what is doing in the village in Ghana, what is happening in Rwanda. I was there for the last five years. I've seen the young people developing apps, incredible apps, you know, that can help with data collection, data processing, and so forth. I think the, the fundamental lesson that we have to confront now is those positive developments are episodic. They happen here, there. We need a systematic approach, a revolution. That's the, and that's what we are working on, the Africa data revolution. We are working with ECA, uh, the Open Data um, Network, as well as the World Wide Web. So unless we confront that lesson that investments in technological development in R&D and also in a more innovative mode to development, we will not um, you know, get there, despite these very positive episodic developments that are taking place. I mean, M-Pesa, M-Pesa is a revolution, but does this cut across Kenya and East Africa? So I think th these are the things we have to confront particularly uh, if we, re we re reflect on the uh, relation between data and the SDGs. We have to, it has to cut across. And we also finally have to deal with the problem of comparability. If Ghana is making progress, is Gambia making the same progress? You know, so that the compar comparability issue will be confronted. Thank you. Yeah. Omar, and then, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, there is a classical example of how technology has been applied in Ghana uh, to improve data. And that has to do with a mobile registration system that was um, uh, piloted with a private sector company, that's Tigo Ghana, UNICEF, and um, the birth and death registration. You know, under, under 12 months, um, let's say under, under one year, registration has been very low since independence. So in 2016, when that project was launched, to employ technology, that's just um, some tablets that were provided by uh, UNICEF and Tigo, and then access to um, data to submit the information, 
and with the help of the community volunteers, in eight out of the 10 regions of the country where it was piloted, within the period of 12 months, the birth and death registry increased birth registration from 58% to 63% in just one year. But it's not in the whole country because at the time, Tigo had coverage in only eight regions. So if you look at the application of that, then we said this is a project that can help bring about a change, a transformation in how we collect data. So when the government launched or uh, mentioned that they're going to go ahead with the national identification system, we saw an opportunity there because we had already started discussions with Statistics Denmark, as I mentioned. So we made a proposal, um, and this happened when we had an engagement with the vice president, that can we take advantage of the national identification system and integrate CRVS, civil and vital statistics system, into that, such like that we will have, we'll come to a point where birth registration, death registration, marriages and divorce, employment, all these things will be integrated into the national identification system such that if in any given year, the Ghana Education Service, for instance, by the click of button, will know what proportion of children should they be expecting to enroll in primary school who will have attained age six across the country in any district that they want to check. By age 18, Electoral Commission, uh, DVLA, would know what is the population who should be voting or getting a driver's license. So with this kind of integrated system, we would apply technology to lessen the burden on the taxpayer on the conduct of surveys. Because once you have an integrated national identification system, you have unique identifiers for the whole population. And so you generate a lot of data that can be used and then you wouldn't need to spend so much money in uh, sample surveys. So these are some of the uh, 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 cases that we are exploring. Okay, Professor Yako, and then we'll turn to the audience. All right, so uh, very quickly, um, you know, answers to your questions about uh, looking at other models and uh, the movie we haven't seen before. So let me just answer this in terms of a micro and a macro. A micro where I think all of us have to be extremely careful when we're looking at models, and a macro where I actually think there's a lot to be happy about, and it's actually why I've moved into the rural areas. So first, the micro and where we should be careful. Um, I think ultimately countries like Ghana that produce cocoa, uh, Ethiopia and coffee should go up the value chain. But we should be cautious. I was doing some research with Professor Emmanuel Echampon looking through uh, archives. I saw some papers saying that Ghana should uh, add value, create chocolates. The only interesting thing about that was that the document in question was 1927. So from 1927 to today, we've been saying exactly the same thing. Why hasn't it worked? Why haven't been, we been able to upgrade on to create chocolate? The world's largest chocolate manufacturing company is called Hershey's. Hershey's is in a place called Hershey, Pennsylvania. And you know why they located there? They have the best cows to produce milk. Chocolate, a huge ingredient is milk, okay? Without good milk, you don't get good chocolate. The other ingredient, of course, is marketing, okay? And so until we can, we can solve those two problems, it's gonna be very, very difficult. So all I'm saying here is this is where we have to be cautious on picking winners. Maybe I'm sounding too much like an economist, but again, part one, uh, uh, caution. Where do we have a lot of areas to be extremely excited about, talking about models? I actually think the model we should be looking at is not actually the Asian countries, but the United States. In the 1950s, 40s, farming in the United States was very similar to that in, agriculture, in uh, Africa. 
single person farmer, right? Something happened there where a lot of innovation was taking place, new technology, all of these uh, car companies, a lot of them got their, their insights from uh, the farming sector. I'm even told that the telephone started in the, uh, big, in the American farms when one farmer wanted to talk to another. They have an empty tin can, they put a wire in between it, and they talk from, hey, Joe, uh, is it gonna rain tomorrow or something? What do you think? And that's how they, they, the, the whole telephone thing started, okay? So all of that is about innovation on the American farm. Let's try and copy that. That's why I'm in the village right now. I think we can get innovation there, create jobs and businesses. My initial response to Ghana government saying this one district, one factory, was as an economist, this is a complete waste, waste of money. And I thought to myself, this is a way in which we experiment. So in each of the 232 districts of Ghana, each one will get a little bit of money, try and add to it, and do some experimentation. Many of them will be a complete failure, but some of them will actually win, okay? Those factories will then ride on the big boom that is gonna, is gonna be affecting everything. What is that boom? Africa has very good demographics. The demographics in China are worsening. Chinese are getting older, and my friends and business people in China are telling me that the price of labor is going up the roof. If we can get our act together here, get our infrastructure right, our education right, fix our ports, we can take that business away from them. So that's what gives me uh, hope, and that's why I'm in the village. Thank you. Okay. So this, this, this has been a very uh, intriguing conversation. Thank you all very much for it. We have to end in 10 minutes um, so that you can have lunch and we not keep the president waiting when he arrives. So I will take just three questions, and please be very brief. One question per person, please. So one, two, um, and three. Okay. Thank you, panel, uh, honorable panel members. I think, um, Mr. Patrick, your, your panel members have been wonderful. And I want to just ask this question seen the very important role that data and um, innovation plays in we achieving the SDG goals. I just want to find out. Um, I learned of the Geospatial Forum, and I want to find out if we need to create a Geospatial Forum for Africa that will help us as um, Mr. I forgot your name, Josh. Omar. Yes. You mentioned that we pulling ourselves together as a continent. I think that we need to have that unison. Now I want to just ask that: How do we, as a continent, create a just special forum that would help us all move and use open space, open geospatial data, to improve our various um, sectors? I'm talking about in terms of security, in terms of migration, it has become a very, very um, critical issue after okay. this so, crisis. Okay, so we've got the question, so we'll move yes. to the second one. Yes, very quick. Um, President Museveni once observed that Africa is a miracle. Despite all the challenges we have, we're still growing then um, above the global rate, and that was about a year ago. As we think about the baseline for the SDGs, it's clear that we're not very clear about where we stand. Um, and given that biz data is a business, everyone needs it, how can we harness the entrepreneurial energies of our youth um, to develop the data, or, to, or to, rather to close the data gap, um, and in the process, build a data industry and, and build the capabilities for artificial intelligence? Okay, interesting question. And the final question, is your mic working now? Thank you, um, Chair, for very fa fascinating sessions. And I would like to go back to a number of points on technology. And last year we had our board meeting in Nigeria. We had a chance to visit a modern factory, refinery factory, industry. And out of, let's just say, for the sake of it, 100 engineers working in the factory 
about 99.5 were non-Africans. They were Asian engineers in that African factories. And the questions I'm going to pose relate to the question you raised earlier about the Asian models. Reviewing the merit of the Asian model, one Nobel laureate said they understood that it was important for them to first close their knowledge and technological gap in order to actually catch up for income convergence. And the question then we have is that what type of ecosystem do we need within the continent to have a technology that goes beyond data and use of ICT to create the type of technology we need for the chemical industries, the pharmaceutical industries, aerospace industries to emerge in this continent because that is where we are going to really achieve value additions and it's way beyond simply using ICT for innovations, the foundational part of it. I would like the, the audience, to the, the panel, to reflect on this. What type of ecosystem do we need for the technology required for SDGs okay. implementations? Thank you. All right, so I'll ask you to, those of you who want to answer, just pick one question uh, so we can wrap up. We'll start with you, and then we'll come to you, Yusuf, and then Dr. Senyal. Okay, I, I believe that uh, the, first, the first question relates to how we can make it across Africa, right? Right. Um, I think you all know that um, our Director General of Statistics sometimes together with ministries, ministers of planning, they do meet annually. And this has been going on, as Professor Nyako has said, probably before many of you have been born. And they have been raising the same, the same questions uh, about uh, the challenges of um, data collection, processing, and dissemination. Um, of course, over the past few years, as we have said, then the data revolution came up through the technological you know, revolution. And that has come also, it has, uh, is figuring in the, uh, in the debates now. The, the second point we should remember is amidst all these problems, you do have countries in Africa, South Africa, Ghana probably, uh, and Kenya, I'm familiar with some of these countries, very, uh, Rwanda, uh, they are actually making leaps uh, in, in this area that we're talking about, dealing with the traditional, the more traditional problems of statistical data collection, dissemination, and also using technology. But what we want, as I have said, to go beyond the positive episodes, like uh, Prof in the village in Ghana, we want to make this a revolution in the continent. Um, it's a legitimate question, how do we do it? It cannot be done in one way. I think we can't escape the issue of leadership. Um, and uh, we do have a, a leadership forum in Africa now, the African Union. That could be a very good starting point, you know, where they would adopt um, indicators for investment in technology. Let's say every country should at least invest 10 or 15 percent in technological development. They can also adopt collective approaches to addressing the underlying problems of data to make so that we are able to track the progress we are making in development. I believe it's okay. a possible, but it's a starting point. Then we can have uh, other approaches as well coming from the private sector, you know, coming from the, the youth, as uh, Kansa has said. Uh, this is, these are all things that have been, have been, have been done. But it, it requires okay. a collective so, approach and also a leadership across the continent. That okay. is how so, I see it. So Thanks. leadership and the, and the private sector. Yusuf. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll go for the one uh, about Asians in our factories. First of all, uh, we should be an open society, so it's good for some people to come. But there's a very good statement that was mentioned yesterday. We invest in unemployment. Our education system is broken. We don't train our people 
how to, to learn the skills that are in line with the opportunities that we have. If we fix that, everything will get done. And there's a lot of information that can guide us on how to fix that. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, you have the last word. Thank you. I, I, I will take uh, Hippolyte's question on um, how do you get Africans to be able to have the skills, uh, industrialize, etc. And the answer to that, and probably something all of us should insist on as we're going through the SDGs, is that local Africans have to be trained. Um, whatever we do when outsiders come to Africa to give us any kind of assistance, there should be some requirement that they be training locally. I don't know if uh, any of you have seen this, uh, uh, when the French president was here with President Nanado, and there was an answer to a question. I encourage you to look it up on YouTube. It was talking, Ghana's president was talking about the fact that we don't need aid anymore. We need to do everything ourselves. It was just wonderful. I encourage you all to uh, take a look at it. But he believed the answer is we have to insist whatever happens, we have to be trained. As a quick example, uh, in the 60s, there were two airlines that were formed. One was Ethiopian Airlines. The other was Ghana Airways. Ghana Airways did it by itself, um, got some help, but didn't train as much its own people. Ethiopian Airlines started off with a company called TWA, Trans World Airlines. It used to be a very, very big airline, and they brought them in to help form Ethiopian Airlines, but they had the condition. After a certain number of years, all members of TWA have to leave, and everything has to go to Ethiopian. Today, Ethiopian Airlines is one of the largest airlines on the continent. Its teacher, TWA, is actually out of business, so Ethiopian has actually outpaced, outlived uh, TWA. And Ghana Airways, we all know the story of Ghana Airways, it's uh, six feet under the ground, okay? <laughs> And so all of that is to say that's how you deal with it. We have to insist whenever we're dealing with SDGs or anything, locals must be trained. If Chinese are coming in to build the roads, teach some young people so when the Chinese leave and finish building their roads, we can get some local youthful entrepreneurs to take up road building. Thank you. So thank you very much. Claire made a special appeal that she say a few words, so I'll let you have the last word, Claire. Thank you. I just wanted to add to what's been said about training and about regional structures and just put in a plea for government action as well. And I think that there's, at the moment, probably not enough advantage of it is being taken of the data revolution, partly because of weak regulatory structures um, and a poor infrastructure. And I think that... in Governments can put in place the kind of regulation that will encourage companies to share data, that would create the different incentives that would make some of all of this, this kind of thing happen. So I just wanted to put in a plea for the role of governments here as well before we close. Thanks. All right. Thank you all very much. All right. Thank you very much. Shall we have a round of applause for them?